Hello everyone. This is SK Mehta, presently the president of the Indian Nuclear Society called INS. I wish to welcome you all to this INS series lectures. This series about uh, 13 lectures is aimed to acquaint you with the various aspects of the nuclear energy its utilization in various areas benefiting humanity, the limitations and the regulatory aspects in safety and protection. One of the main objectives of the INS is to promote the advancement of nuclear science and engineering and technology related to the atomic nucleus and the allied sciences and arts. With this objective, INS has been disseminating information through journals, books, reports, newsletters, seminars, and conferences. These have mainly been to keep the INS members and other scientific communities and organizations well informed about the development in the various areas of science and technology within India and world over. Or it is realized that there is a need to keep the various professionals, undergraduate students, and general public knowledgeable in their respective fields of nuclear science and engineering. For the benefit of, uh, of the public, some of the important and the common application of nuclear being for power, industrial use, medical diagnosis and treatment, agriculture, food preservation, and various other areas. This lecture series is made in simple language and illustration with the aim to inform the general viewer about the science, engineering, and technology, social benefits of the nuclear, application of nuclear carrier benefits in nuclear and regulatory and safety of the nuclear energy. The presentations are prepared and narrated by experts on each topic in a way that the viewers with no background knowledge about the nuclear science and engineering can understand. Our effort will be to constantly provide information about newer benefits to the society emerging out of the pain-taking research and nuclear science and engineers. Viewers are encouraged to comment, suggest, and put forward question to the experts. The channel of the constructive communication will always be open in INS, which is website ins-india.org. Hello everyone and welcome to INS lecture series covering the fundamentals of nuclear energy and its application in power production, agriculture, food preservation, human health care and many more. For a quick overview, the titles of all the 13 lectures in INS lecture series are listed here. This lecture series also includes a presentation on Carrier Opportunities in the Department of Atomic Energy. In this presentation, titled Radioisotopes in Healthcare Applications, we will see the useful applications of radioisotopes in human healthcare. I am Madhav Malia from Radio Pharmaceuticals Division of Baba Atomic Research Center. The moment we hear the words radiation, radioisotope and radioactivity, probably this is the picture that comes to our mind. The harmful effect of radiation and radiation based technologies. However, in reality, radioisotopes have immense useful applications in almost every field of science and industry such as in biology, hydrology, agriculture, food technology, industries, chemical sciences, material sciences 
and healthcare application. Today, we will exclusively focus on healthcare applications of radioisotopes. Nuclear medicine is that speciality which involves application of radioactive substances in organ function evaluation, diagnosis or therapy of various clinical conditions in human body. Therefore, it will be interesting to know how nuclear medicine is different from normal medicines that we use in our day-to-day -day life. Nuclear medicine contains a radioisotope and that is the most important difference between nuclear medicine and normal pharmaceuticals that we take in our day-to-day -day life. It is generally administered in very small amounts in nanogram to microgram quantities. And it can be designed for a specific task, for example, organ function evaluation, diagnosis, or therapy of various diseases. Nuclear medicine can be used for organ function evaluation or for diagnosis and therapy of cancer. It can provide answers to questions like whether cancer is present in the body, what is the extent of its spread in the body, and whether cancer therapy given to a patient is effective or not. It will be interesting to note some facts about current nuclear medicine practice globally as well as in India. More than 80% of the diagnostic nuclear medicine procedures carried out worldwide use the isotope technetium 99M. Thyroid related cancers are best treated by radioisotope of iodine, that is iodine 131. Technetium 99M, gallium 68, and fluorine 18 are some of the important diagnostic radioisotopes used for diagnosis of various types of cancers. Treatment of several other types of cancers uses radioisotopes such as lutetium-177, yttrium-90, rhenium-188, etc. Application of radioisotope in healthcare is expanding globally and in India. In this context, it is only appropriate to know more about radioisotopes and their applications. In this presentation, we will briefly see what are radioisotopes, how do we produce artificial radioisotopes, and some examples of radioisotope application in healthcare. We will begin with radioisotopes. Before understanding radioisotope, we will first see what are isotopes. Isotopes are atoms of the same element having the same atomic number but different mass number. For example, hydrogen has three isotopes rhodium or normal hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium. Here you can see that normal hydrogen and deuterium are stable, but tritium is radioactive. So, Radioisotopes can be defined as isotopes that emit radiation. Radioactivity is the phenomenon of spontaneous emission of radiation by an unstable nucleus. This phenomenon was discovered by this gentleman, Henry Becquerel. If you look at the simple atomic structure, it has a central nucleus containing protons and neutrons and electrons equal in number to that of protons revolve around the nucleus. You may also be aware that protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged and neutrons are neutral. Radioactivity is thus the story of an unstable nucleus. Radioactivity is the means for an unstable nucleus to attain stability by releasing energy in the form of radiation. 
three main routes by which an unstable nucleus releases its excess energy are emission of particles such as alpha or beta or emission of gamma radiations. It can be noted here that alpha particle is nothing but nucleus of a helium atom and beta particles are electrons. Beta emissions can be of two types, beta minus and beta plus. Beta minus is an electron and beta plus is called a positron. Every radioisotope has its own nuclear characteristics such as type of radiation it emits, energy of radiation and half-life. Half-life of a radioisotope is defined as the time taken to reduce its radioactivity to half the initial value. We will also look into the units of radioactivity. Conventional unit of radioactivity is Curie, named so in honor of Nobel laureates Mary Curie and her husband Pierre Curie, who did pioneering work in radioactivity. One Curie is defined as that amount of radioactive substance which show 3.7 into 10 to the power 10 disintegrations per second. The SI unit of radioactivity is Becquerel and one Becquerel is one disintegration per second. The figure here shows penetrating properties of different radiations. Note that alpha particle can be stopped by a thin sheet of paper while beta particles require a thin aluminum sheet. Please note the very high penetrating property of gamma radiation which can penetrate even a thick block of lead. Later, we will see that application of a radioisotope also depends on the penetrating properties of radiations it emits. Now, I will try to address this question. Why do we produce artificial radioisotopes? Some of you may be thinking why we need to produce artificial radioisotopes when we have natural radioisotopes like tritium, 14 carbon, 235 uranium, 40 potassium, etc. The question is why can't we use them for nuclear medicine applications? Let us analyze this question. Even if we assume we can use them for nuclear medicine application, can we get them in sufficient quantity from nature? If you look at the natural abundance of these natural radioisotopes, it will be obvious that it will be an Herculean task to obtain sufficient quantity of these natural radioisotopes. Even if we obtain them in sufficient quantities, the use of radioisotope for a given application depend on energy of radiation, the type of radiation, half-life of the radioisotope and the chemistry of radioisotope. Unfortunately, naturally occurring radioisotopes do not have the right combination of energy, type, half-life and chemistry suitable for nuclear medicine applications. Now that we realize the necessity of producing artificial radioisotopes with characteristics suitable for nuclear medicine applications, let us briefly see how it can be done. Without going into too much of details, I will try to explain the approach used for producing artificial radioisotopes. For this, we should know n by p ratio of a nucleus. The n by p ratio is simply the ratio of number of neutrons to number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. If we analyze the n by p ratio of stable isotopes in nature, we will find that they have certain value of n by p ratio. 
it implies that if we altered this n by p ratio by some means the nucleus may become unstable and therefore radioactive this is precisely what is done to produce artificial radioisotopes now the n by p ratio can be altered either by adding a neutron or by adding a proton to a stable nucleus addition of a neutron to the nucleus to alter the n by p ratio can be done in a nuclear reactor and addition of a proton to alter the n by p ratio can be carried out in a device called cyclotron so first we will see how radioisotopes are produced in a nuclear reactor when we think of a nuclear reactor we generally visualize a dome shaped structure but note that all reactor buildings are not dome shaped for example the druva reactor building in barc is rather a cube than a dome now let us look at what is inside the nuclear reactor building the main component of the reactor is a steel vessel called calandria and inside calandria the nuclear fuel is assembled nuclear fuel is nothing but 235 uranium in the form of pellets uranium 235 undergoes fission by absorbing a neutron and each fission process release large amount of energy along with three new neutrons these neutrons can carry out further fission of uranium 235 and this chain reaction continue in nuclear reactor in a controlled manner please look into other presentations in ins lecture series to know more about what is happening inside a nuclear reactor our interest here is the availability of large excess of controlled neutrons which can be used to carry out nuclear reactions to produce radio isotopes now let us see how the target is introduced into a nuclear reactor the target is the material which undergoes nuclear reaction by absorbing a neutron and gets converted into radio isotope the target material is filled in aluminum cans and the aluminum cans are stacked inside an empty pipe called tray rod now the tray rod is introduced into the calandria where the target material undergoes nuclear reaction by absorbing neutron the nuclear reaction of the target material can be visualized as shown inside the reactor the target nucleus combines with a neutron to form a compound nucleus the compound nucleus is generally in a high energy state and it releases its excess energy in the form of a gamma radiation or particles such as proton subsequently it gets converted into the radio isotope nuclear reactions are of several types and it is covered in detail in other presentations in ins lecture series here we will briefly discuss only one type of nuclear reaction called radiative neutron capture or n gamma reaction here a neutron is captured by the target nucleus and the compound nucleus form release its excess energy in the form of gamma radiation called prompt gamma radiation then the compound nucleus transforms into radio isotope 
as an example the production of molybdenum 99 is shown here to produce molybdenum 99 we use molybdenum 98 as the target it undergoes radiative neutron capture forming molybdenum 99 compound nucleus which then transforms into 99 molybdenum radioisotope molybdenum 99 is a very important medical radioisotope with a half life of 66 hours its radioactive decay leads to another radioisotope technetium 99m with a half life of 6 hours which is used extensively in diagnostic procedures it is worth to note here that even today more than 80% of the diagnostic procedures are carried out using this radioisotope there are several other radioisotope produced through this route that is n gamma route the most important ones are shown here 176 lutetium undergoes n gamma reaction forming 177 lutetium which is an excellent therapeutic radioisotope used for therapy of several type of cancers such as neuroendocrine cancers prostate cancer etc 152 samarium undergoes n gamma reaction forming 153 samarium which is used for bone pain palliation 59 cobalt undergoes n gamma reaction forming 60 cobalt and 60 cobalt is used in radiography camera as well as in teletherapy machines a discussion on teletherapy machine is beyond the scope of this presentation however it will be covered in other lectures in ins lecture series the radioisotopes produced in the reactor require some processing steps before it can be used for nuclear medicine applications this is carried out in radioisotope processing laboratories equipped with special lead shielded facilities the highly radioactive targets irradiated in the nuclear reactor are transported in a lead cask to the radioisotope processing laboratory just to give you an idea about what is radioisotope processing remember that molybdenum 98 in the form of an oxide molybdenum trioxide is used as target for the production of molybdenum 99 but the solid molybdenum 99 trioxide cannot be directly used for nuclear medicine applications molybdenum 99 trioxide is therefore dissolved in sodium hydroxide to obtain sodium molybdate solution which is then used for various applications as mentioned earlier the n by p ratio can also be altered by adding a proton to the stable nucleus in our attempt to produce radioisotopes it should be noted here that neutron being neutral does not face any resistance while interacting with the nucleus however in the case of a proton as it approaches the nucleus it faces tremendous coulombic repulsion from the protons inside the nucleus therefore the incoming proton should have sufficiently high energy to overcome the repulsive interaction from the nucleus and interact with the nucleus that is the reason why the protons needs to be accelerated in a device called cyclotron in a cyclotron the charged particle like proton is accelerated to sufficiently high energy and then made to bombard with the target 
and the target undergoes nuclear reaction transforming into radioisotope. We will not go into more details on the cyclotron route of production of radioisotopes, but the table here lists some of the medically important radioisotopes produced in a cyclotron with details such as their half-life, the nuclear reaction route and the energy required by the charged particle to carry out the nuclear reaction. Now that we have obtained some idea on radioisotope production, let us see how these radioisotopes are put to use in nuclear medicine. As mentioned in the earlier slides, the main role of nuclear medicine is in evaluating the functional status of different organs in human body and also for the diagnosis and therapy of dreaded diseases like cancer. The challenge here is to perform organ function evaluation and detection of cancer which is present inside the body in a non-invasive manner. So how to do that? The solution is to design a compound which when administered in human body preferentially accumulate in the organ of interest or the cancer cells and then send a signal that comes out of the body and which can be detected from outside the body. And radiopharmaceuticals are that category of radioactive drugs which are very safe for human administration and which when administered in human body accumulate in the target organ or in cancer cells and can be used for organ function evaluation or diagnosis or therapy of cancer. Radiopharmaceuticals are prepared by chemically tagging a radioisotope to an appropriate biologically active molecule which has the ability to accumulate in target organ of interest or cancer cells. So, the biomolecule can be compared to a bus to certain destination and the radioisotope is like a passenger and like we have different buses for different destinations we have different radio pharmaceuticals for organ function evaluation diagnosis and therapy of cancer now we will see what type of radioisotopes we should use for different applications let me take you back to the slide we have already seen. We know that gamma radiations are highly penetrating and they can penetrate human tissues. To monitor anything that is happening inside the body, some signal should come out of the body which we can detect from outside the body. Therefore, it is needless to say we will be using gamma emitting radioisotope for diagnostic applications. Beta and alpha on the other hand has very low penetrating power. This is because they lose their energy very fast by depositing their energy in the tissue through which they pass. Later, you will see that this property is used for treatment purposes. I also mentioned that there are two types of beta particles, beta minus and beta plus. Beta plus is called a positron or positive electron. Positrons undergo a phenomenon called annihilation when it combines with an electron. In the annihilation process, both beta plus and electron vanish and in its place two gamma radiations of 511 keV each will appear and they will move in opposite directions. These two gamma radiations can be used for diagnostic purposes. Thus, indirectly 
A positron emitting radioisotope can also be used for diagnostic purposes. Radioisotopes such as fluorine 18, gallium 68 are examples of positron emitting diagnostic radioisotopes. Depending upon the radioisotope used, radiopharmaceuticals are divided into diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals and therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals. Some examples of diagnostic radioisotopes are fluorine 18, technetium 99M, iodine 131, and gallium 68. Some examples for therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals are lutetium-177, iodine-131, samarium-153, and yttrium-90. Please note that iodine-131, which emits gamma radiations as well as beta radiation, can be used both for diagnostic purposes as well as therapeutic purposes. Now, we will see some examples for radiopharmaceuticals that are in clinical use and how they work. Before we dive into that, let us see how a typical diagnostic procedure is carried out. The patient is first injected with a suitable radiopharmaceutical intended for a specific application. After certain time, during which the radiopharmaceutical accumulates in the organ of interest or the cancer tissue. As the case may be, the patient is taken to a scanning device called gamma camera. The gamma camera scan the patient's body and record the gamma radiations emitted by the radiopharmaceutical distributed inside the patient's body. The scan will show where the radiopharmaceutical has been accumulated and looking at the scan, a learned nuclear medicine physician can decode the clinical information. Two types of gamma cameras are used depending upon the nature of diagnostic radioisotope used for the preparation of radiopharmaceutical. For a gamma emitting radioisotope like technetium 99M, SPECT camera is used. SPECT stands for Single Photon Emission Computed Tomograph. For a positron emitting radioisotope, a PET camera is used. PET stands for Positron Emission Tomograph. One of the major applications of nuclear medicine is in the evaluation of thyroid function. Thyroid is a vital hormone gland in human body that produces two important iodine containing hormones T3 and T4. The iodine required for this purpose is obtained from our diet. So, this body physiology is utilized in nuclear medicine application for evaluating thyroid function. Please note here that our human thyroid has two lobes. As I mentioned, thyroid require iodine for biosynthesis of T3 and T4 hormones. So, if we provide radioactive iodine-131 to the patient, it will behave exactly like non-radioactive iodine and it will start accumulating in patient's thyroid. Since iodine-131 emits a gamma radiation, its accumulation in thyroid can be monitored using a gamma camera. So, for thyroid function evaluation, the patient is given small quantity of radioactive sodium iodide solution orally and after certain time, the patient's thyroid is scanned. Here you can see how a normal functional thyroid looks like 
and how an abnormal functional thyroid looks like. So, by taking advantage of body physiology, thyroid function evaluation is carried out. Now, we will see how a glucose mimicking radiopharmaceutical is used for diagnosis of cancer. A tumor is formed in human body when cells start growing abnormally consequent to certain type of mutation. The cells of certain type of tumor can migrate from primary site to other parts of the body through blood and this process is called metastasis. Tumors with such tendency are called malignant and malignant tumors are called cancers. The detection of cancer and the extent of its spread inside the body is extremely important to make clinical decisions. So, how is it done? We know every human cell requires energy for its function and survival. This energy mainly comes from the metabolism of glucose. Therefore, it is obvious that a fast-growing tumor will require more glucose than a normal tissue. Therefore, our requirement is a radiopharmaceutical which behaves like glucose. Such a radiopharmaceutical can be prepared from glucose itself by replacing the hydroxyl group with fluorine 18 which is a cyclotron produced positron emitting radioisotope. This radiopharmaceutical is called FDG or fluorodeoxyglucose. When FDG is injected in patient's body, it will be taken up preferentially by cancer cells since their energy requirement is more and FDG behaves like glucose. A scan of the patient taken with PET camera will show intense spots indicating accumulation of FDG in cancer's tissue and a nuclear medicine physician will use these scans for further course of action. Another targeted approach for diagnosis and therapy of cancer is utilizing some specific interactions in human body. It was observed that different type of cancer cells express different type of proteins called receptors or antigens on their cell membrane in large numbers. Now, peptides which are small sequence of amino acids can be designed which can specifically bind to these receptors overexpressed in cancer cells. Similarly, there are antibodies which can specifically bind to antigens present in the cancer cells. Therefore, these peptides or antibodies can act as a vehicle to transport radioisotopes suitable for diagnosis or therapy. Just to give you some examples for receptors, somatostatin receptors are overexpressed in cancers of neuroendocrine origin. Similarly, estrogen receptors and Herceptin receptors are overexpressed in breast cancers and prostate specific membrane antigen is overexpressed in prostate cancer cells. Like I mentioned, we can design unique peptides which can specifically bind to certain type of receptors. Tyrosine 3 octreotide and tyrosine 3 octreotate are two such peptides which can bind to somatostatin receptors overexpressed in neuroendocrine tumor. 
without going too deep into the technicality i wish to mention here that sometimes it is very difficult to tag a radio isotope directly to the peptide therefore the peptide is modified by adding certain groups to enable radio isotope tagging without difficulty the modification however has to be done such that the specific binding ability of the peptide to the receptor is not affected and this is a challenge the radio pharmaceutical chemist face while developing new radio pharmaceuticals in the example that is shown here tyrosine 3 octreotide is modified with a group called dota to obtain dota top the function of dota is to strongly hold the radio isotope while the peptide takes the radio isotope to the target the process of tagging gallium 68 a positron emitting radio isotope to dota top is shown here it can be seen that gallium 68 is bound to the dota part and the radio pharmaceutical thus formed is called 68 gallium dota top it is also important to note that the modification required to the peptide changes with the nature of radio isotope used for tagging technetium 99n the peptide may be modified with a group called hynic hynic stands for hydrazino nicotinic acid just like the peptide is modified with dota for radio labeling with gallium in the previous slide in this case tyrosine 3 octreotide is modified with hynic to obtain hynic tau which can be used for radio labeling with technetium here the process of tagging technetium 99m to the peptide is shown and it can be seen that technetium 99m is attached to the hynic group of the modified peptide for diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumors either technetium 99m hynic tau or 68 gallium dota top can be used one of these peptides is injected into the patient and after permitting sufficient time for the radio pharmaceutical to accumulate in cancer tissue the patient undergoes a scan for technetium 99m hynic tau spect camera is used and for scanning with gallium 68 dota tau pet camera is used i am sure the viewer know why is it so here some typical scan obtained with 99m technetium hynic tau is shown and the blue arrow indicates the neuroendocrine cancer lesions next we will briefly see how therapy works and some examples of therapeutic radio pharmaceuticals we have seen that the range of beta and alpha is much lower than that of gamma and the reason attributed was that both alpha and beta lose much energy as it moves through the tissue the energy thus deposited in the tissue and result in damage of vital cellular components including the dna thereby resulting in cell death this is the philosophy of radiation therapy just to satisfy the curiosity i will touch upon the mechanism of action of radiation in cells radiation can interact with cells in two ways direct effect and indirect effect the effect arising out of direct interaction of radiation with dna or other vital molecules inside the cell 
is called direct heat. Alternatively, the radiation can interact with water which constitutes nearly 80% of the cell. The effect arising out of such interaction is called indirect effect. As indicated in the previous slide, indirect effect, the radiation interact with DNA and other macromolecules inside the cell and damage them permanently. Since these macromolecules are vital for cellular function and survival, the damage can eventually lead to cell death. In indirect effect, radiation interacts with water leading to radiolysis of water. Radiolysis of water leads to formation of a host of radioactive species called radicals which can then damage the DNA and other vital molecules inside the cells. These damages to vital molecules will again lead to cell death. Now we will see some clinical examples of radiation therapy. It is important to remember here that the targeting methods remains the same whether it is for diagnosis or for therapy. We have seen earlier that iodine-131 is used for functional evaluation of thyroid because thyroid has an inherent ability to absorb iodine from our diet. While the gamma radiation emitted by iodine-131 is used for thyroid function evaluation, the beta radiation emitted by iodine-131 can be used to kill the thyroid cancer cells. The only difference is that while we use very small amounts of iodine-131 for thyroid function evaluation, higher doses are used for thyroid cancer therapy. Typical diagnostic dose of iodine-131 is 50 to 100 microcurie, whereas for therapy, 50 to 80 millicurie of iodine-131 is administered in patients. We have also seen how radio tagged peptides such as gallium 68 dota top or technetium 99m hynic top can be used for diagnosis of neuroendocrine cancers. The same peptides or their analogs can be used to carry a therapeutic radioisotope to treat cancers. An example is shown here where the peptide dota tate is used to tag therapeutic radioisotopes such as lutetium-177 or yttrium-90 for the treatment of neuroendocrine cancer. Corresponding radiopharmaceuticals are 177-lutetium-dota-tate or 90-yttrium-dota-tate. These therapeutic radioisotope tag peptides when administered in cancer patients accumulate preferentially in cancer cells and the beta radiations from the therapeutic radioisotope kill the cancer cells as explained in previous slides. Typical dose of 90 yttrium dota tate and 177 lutetium dota tate is shown here for information. Cancer therapy using radio labeled peptides is also called peptide receptor radionucleidic therapy or PRRNT. A natural question that can come to our mind is whether radiation therapy is really effective or not. The scan shown here is one of the numerous examples which shows the effectiveness of radiation therapy. These diagnostic scans of patient are obtained using technetium 99M hynic top after the patient had received several cycles of lutetium-177 dota tate therapy. It can be seen that the number of cancer lesions shown as blue arrow progressively decreases after each cycle of therapy. What I have shown so far are just few examples of diagnostic and therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals. It is important to note that 
Baba Atomic Research Center has indigenously developed several other radio pharmaceuticals which are now available to nuclear medicine centers across our country through board of radiation and isotope technology BARC BRIT and Radiation Medicine Center has been doing a yeoman service to the nation by making available effective radiation based medicine at an affordable cost on that positive note i thank you all for your patient listening and if you have any questions please feel free to write to me or put it in comments i will certainly answer them in the best possible way i can thank you